everybody to a new episode of the counterpoise podcast i am the host every stevenson joined with my other lovely host hey hey Hello, everybody. go ahead oh go ahead sam I was... you got it oh hello guys i'm malik foster another co-host for the counterpoise podcast Hey, hey, everybody, and I am the third co-host, Samantha Adams, and like he said, we have a great topic for you today. Um, today, we're talking about media's dark side. It sounds spooky, but um, the reason why we call it media's dark side is because um, we're going to be talking about um, the imagery that the media portrays for Black folks. And when we're talking about the media, we don't just mean, we don't mean like necessarily movies and stuff. We look talking about the media, like news media, social media, things like that, and the way that it affects the mental health of Black people. Um, and so um, let's just dive right in, right? Um, starting off talking about the news media specifically, um, look at COVID, right? When we start looking at COVID, you see how um, the news media is really focused, it's like hyper-focused almost on making sure black folks take the vaccine. You know what I'm saying? And it's interesting because um, like, yeah, black people are definitely suspicious about and very wary of the vaccine. Not all black people, but many black people. But a lot of that has to do with the historical aspects of, um, I, I don't even want to just say America, just society and vaccines. Like just don't have a good track record. So you know, and the more you know, the better off you are, right? So, you know, but they're doing all kinds of stuff to try to cater to Black folks. Like, in one state, the governor was like, oh, yeah, they enter you in some kind of lottery. They're trying to give all these incentives all over the place just to get Black folks to get the vaccine. And um, I just think it's, it's really interesting because you don't see them doing that with any other group of people, despite the fact that Although Black people have definitely been targeted um, with regards to how, with, with regards to just vaccines in general, mm -hmm. Black people aren't the only ones that have been targeted, but they're definitely going hard for Black folks to come take this vaccine, but they ain't talking about reparations. Well, California is, but you know what I mean? So what do you guys think about that? Um, yeah, so um, that article, or excuse me, I can jump in and speak on that subject. Uh, recently, I was trolling on Instagram, and, and I saw someone was talking about how uh, President Biden had made an initiative to try to uh, contact and reach out to um, other citizens, you know, Black citizens in particular, and asked that, um, excuse me, asked, but the way that he had structured the st statement, which was like, you know, hey, we're going to reach out to a lot of our, you know, beauty salons and a lot of our, you know, barber shops and a lot of places that we know, say a lot of black people like to congregate and, you know, kind of fellowship it, if you will, in a in, in, in sense, um, around each other and talk. And we want these places to be places in which, you know, the vaccine can be administrated. We know that these are places, and again, like you said, um, these are spaces that a lot of us hold as, um, if you will, community centers or, you know, not necessarily recreational centers, but it's a place where you, you know, you talk shop, you might sit down and, you know, you know, hang out and, and, and you know, see some of the people from your neighborhood, some, maybe some guys that you might go to school with or, you know, play ball with, they might come get there, cut the same place, you know, whatever the case may be. And, you know, you fellowship with your people. So I think to try to like break that down and, and then like push that narrative in there, but again, we're not hearing any type of narrative for, you know, legislation or any type of narratives to try to address certain things. And in fact, I think recently we got an article saying that there was a push to stop um, um, payments for 
um, student loan forgiveness, but I think there may be an initiative with the new budget that was supposed to be addressing making it um, making payments for I think community colleges um, um, available to to some citizens. So while I hear that they're going to say that they weren't necessarily looking to address you know previous student loans. They are looking to maybe make something within the current administration to do something towards current student debt. But nonetheless, I just feel like there's a lot of inconsistency with how the party is looking to come in and, and I mean the Democratic Party in particular, um, looking to come in and address um, the Black community in some aspects and, and act like there's a concern for them, but, you know, regress in others and even, you know, digress, if you will, with, with just the community college initiative as opposed to one that was supposed to, you know, uh, affect either previous student debts and other previous harms that may have came from the um, the existence of, like you said, the replications rather of slavery and the fact that most of these people in these communities have the, the standards that they have for a living. So um, yeah, I definitely think that there's something that this administration um, is getting a side eye for me on in particular, because it's like, you know, Okay, I see you making a big initiative for the vaccine, but where's that same energy when it comes towards addressing other social harms that could really affect uh, the community? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I agree with you on that E and about um, you know that um, this administration is focusing more on you know, other things besides reparations, which I think would really help out the Black community the most. And that's something that was talked about during the elections a lot. That was a national debate that, um, you know, uh, Kamala Harris, clearly she steered away from. She says, well, I can't do anything only for you guys. So that's that, that was that on her end. And Joe Biden, he was like, you know, just dodging it. So, I mean, I don't expect much on that end from them, but they can't expect that much from us on our end. Like, so when they, if they need some Democrats to get elected, don't look at us. You should look at, you know, all the people you want to give benefits for. Maybe you should ask the Asian people. Maybe you should ask the other people, the white people, the, the you know, all the other different groups, Hispanics, you know, for things instead of us. But maybe they'll help you out. Don't look towards black people. Um, that's my opinion on that. Um, but as far as COVID, it's very interesting that they're, they're willing to give us money to take a vaccine shot. Um, they're awarding cash or even having these lotteries where you can get tens of thousands of dollars, but they don't want to award uh, reparations for even like some of the most recent things that have happened. And I've documented like Tulsa, uh, they don't want to award money for that. Um, just anything. They don't want to give black people any benefits in large scales, but for some reason they want to award us payments to take a vaccine shot. So that got my eyes looking, my eyes are wide open, sorry. Um, my eyes are a little itchy here. Um, but um, yeah, I find that a little interesting that they want to pay us to pay black people specifically and targeting the black businesses. Um, you know, because they know that we have a lot of uh, barber shops, nail shops, and um, hair salons, beauty shops, and stuff like that. Targeting those kind of black businesses, uh, I find that very interesting because they know that a lot of black people use that stuff. Um, so I find it interesting. I, I don't know. I don't think they're going to white businesses and um, saying, "Hey, hey, guys, get this vaccine." and we'll pay you this amount of money. I mean, I don't even think they need to do that because they're already awarding um, under the uh, the um, the PPP loans and stuff like that. They're already exactly. over awarding some of these white businesses already. So they don't even need to incentivize them anymore uh, to, get, yeah. to get COVID. But go ahead, Sam, I'm, I'm finished with my thought. Yeah, I was just saying the CARES Act is what you're referring to. Um, yeah, and yeah, then, the CARES Act, but yeah, PPP mm -hmm. loans and stuff like that. Yeah, that's all on the yeah. CARES Act, yeah. Yeah, um, one thing I wanted to add uh, is that I think it's important to know or to note that COVID is not a racial disease. You know, people from all different walks of life have contracted COVID. However, in Africa, you know, it was not on the same scale as it was everywhere else in the world. Okay, those are just facts, numbers, stats, all that stuff, right? But 
also, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I don't know if it was true, if it was just a conspiracy theory or what, but I remember the whole controversy surrounding the Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation and them doing, wanting to do testing um, of vaccines. And I do remember there was a doctor in Italy, I believe it was, that had made the comment on, on Twitter about um, testing the vaccine in Africa. And it was like, first of all, why are you gonna go to Africa to test it? Africans are not contracting COVID like everywhere else. So why are you gonna te uh, test it on a group of people that don't have it? Test yeah, it they, they wanted to they test it Sam, when the cases were so small in Africa, it didn't make like It sense. didn't make any logical sense. But meanwhile, in Italy, it was going, it was killing off all the old people, you know? Or maybe so, we should start we should... off in China where it so-called originated. Right, but if you're not gonna start in China, at the time where it's at its peak in Italy, an Italian doctor says, do it in Africa. Why not do it in Italy? That's, the numbers are higher there. You know what I mean? And I believe at the time that was when Italy had the highest numbers in the world, right? So, you know, it, it's interesting that, you know, Black folks, and when I say Black, I don't mean just African-American. I also mean Africans, just people of African descent around the world are continuously being targeted um, for vaccines. Now, on one hand, you know, we don't want people to get sick and die from this disease. You know what I mean? Or from this illness. But on the other hand, there's a track record of, of using black people as guinea pigs when that's not what they signed up for. And so this, the suspicion comes from a legitimate place. It doesn't come like just out of the air. And I think that I understand the purpose of trying to, to target them to an extent and black folks to an extent because you want, you don't want them to get sick and die from COVID. But at the same time, black people have every right to be nervous about it because it's like, and then on top of that, you know, it hasn't been out a long time. Like there's a whole lot of different factors on top. And then just compound that with the other conspiracy theories that are in place with regards to COVID. Um, and, you know, when you start talking about the media and the way that they're doing it, like, like Everett said, like, they're going into like the heartbeats of communities like barbershops and all these other places, the lotto, all that to try to get into, um, to get folks to do it, right? But that leads me um, to, to bring up something else about the media as it relates to black folks and white folks, right? It, it's how are black people and white people portrayed in the media? They're portrayed two totally different ways, right? Like for example, you can have a 17-year-old black boy and a 17-year-old white boy commit the same exact crime. Let's say they rob a store or something or snatch somebody's purse. When the news media puts that story out there, that 17-year-old boy is a 17-year-old boy. Oh, he must be troubled. Maybe he's got some mental health issues, yada, 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 yada. And it's the 17-year-old black kid, it's oh, 17 year old black man robbed the convenience store today, putting the clerk at gunpoint, blah, blah. And then you just start going through those things. So it makes the black kid look like this monster who's just violent, who just woke up and chose violence that day when the white kid is just somebody who's got challenges. And it's just interesting the way the media does that. It's, it's propaganda. And I learned about that in high school. I took this media class in high school. And we were told to like have, look at these comparisons. You know what I mean? And I just think that it's very interesting. Um, and a lot of times when you have these little towns all around the country that don't have any black people in them, it's one of the things and reasons why people continue to believe that black people are violent. You know what I mean? The way the news- I'm here to just come and say like, that's one of the things that like you said, that has been going on in the media for a while. And I know like, you know, we've seen also, around the time of like the Clinton administration when they, you know, coined the term of uh, hyper predator, you know what I'm saying? Okay. And, yeah. and, and then it was like, you know, well, you know, here's this guy, yeah, here's a, you know, look at this guy who was on this work release program. I can't remember the name of the man, but they try to use him as like the face of just like, wow, we need to just have such stronger, you know, 
uh, crime, excuse me, uh, enforcement laws and, and, and keeping people in jail for longer um, times due to, I guess, if you want to say for these violent crimes, if you will. Um, and so that's something that's been done in the media as far as like the way, you know, things are being portrayed. And I also think, again, the imagery of what we see and like how, you know, the lives in which, you know, have been taken and the ones that's pl plastered on TV all happen to be of like, you know, primarily of one color. And that's one of the things that's like really troubling, right? Because it's like, you know, um, to me, I feel like it, it, it also, like you said, it fosters the mindset for people in a smaller environment because that's what they'll be able to see and, and they'll start to associate that. But more importantly, on a, on a large scale, um, on a large scale matter, it also kind of enforces people to look at lives and black lives in particular and not have the same type of value or respect for it as they would say another. And that's the biggest issue that I have with it because it's like it desensitizes individuals to, to seeing uh, the loss of a black life or, um, or the interaction and bringing in a certain level of tension but then, you know, you running into and, and, and dealing with people of color. And that's the biggest issue I have with media when, when, when these type of things are um, displayed, when those type of biases are displayed, when, when, when um, you know, you hear a storyline involving two young men, you know, juveniles at, in the same sense, but one is portrayed one way and another, you know what I'm saying, gets portrayed another. So I just want to add that in there as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, I want to I, I want to say I agree with your guys' sentiments um, that the media portrays black people in a negative light in many aspects. Every aspect you can think of that's a negative thing, um, black people are portrayed in a negative light. Whether it's health, right, physical health, uh, oh, you you guys are doing bad here. Uh, whether it's just like every day being a law-abiding citizens. Oh, look at you guys, always breaking the law, always doing something wrong, um, always. Um, you know, doing this, that, and a third, like, oh, every time maybe uh, uh, a sentencing, right, from some injustice that black people feel that have taken place, oh, why do you guys got to loot and rob, you're tearing down your own communities, they're always trying to create this narrative, like, we're always doing something bad when we're trying to resist the current system that doesn't benefit us. I mean, it just makes sense on some of the things that black people do to, um, resist the current system because it's not working for us clearly um you know there's very little hope for younger people out there at least that's how a lot of young people feel there's not that much hope so um they want to combat the system and maybe taking the streets is the only way they think they can actually defeat uh the current injustices that are taking place uh, especially black people black people who are empathizers with black people as well and just young people in general, I think it's it's not good out here for most people. So, but specifically black people, we've got the worst. So, you know, I try to keep it there because that's that's the group that's going through it the worst um, from a financial standpoint um, speaking. So, um, yeah, I, I hope this administration does something to, you know, shed a better light with black people. I know there's been a lot of businesses trying to. Um, get more black CEOs and stuff like that. And I don't think that is necessarily the solution to the problem. I think the solution to the problem of the black image with the media portraying us compared to white people is actually black people promoting their own image. So promoting their own image through media and not just like uh, what we currently have. We need a new brand of stuff and more media, just like all the other groups have a lot of media because media is one of the most powerful things on earth. So I think, you know, we need more than what we have. Like we have some um, black owned stuff, but it's not much. So we need more. And I think if the administration wants to help us out, they should supply some grants, um, some money to some people that's trying to do some media company startups so they can really get, get it to the level that can reach the black community on a mass level. I know we have people on YouTube, um, you know, social media, they're trying to do their thing, but we need, you know, cable networks too, and mainstream stuff too. We don't just need the grassroots stuff, which is nice and it helps, but we need mainstream stuff, stuff that's just constantly gonna be in your ear, stuff that will have the money behind it to actually convey the message 
Yeah, I don't have to push back on that one and say that I think that this is honestly that time um, because of the fact that I feel like of what you just brought up at the end of your conversation and what we are here doing today as well is the fact that like now more than ever, we do have this era of which, you know, you have your own TV stream, if you will. You know what I'm saying? You, and, 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 and that again, that's to a degree, right? Because we did just see recently President Trump just got re-banned from using some of the platforms. I don't know if you guys got a chance to see that as well, but I think they say- 2023. Yeah, like he was banned to like 2023 after just being reactivated on a few accounts. So, you know- um, I, you think have, was I, account, I think there was sneak accounts though, because he was, he was already banned. Oh, you said there were fake accounts that they were having that. Were were fake accounts, but they they were his accounts, but they were like. Oh, but they were like the main main account that he had. Mm-hmm. He tried to just make a new account type of thing. Right. Okay. But yeah, nonetheless, I was gonna say, um, with with us being able to have social media in this type of era, you know, um, I think you have to watch for again what can happen with uh, happens in a lot of times when they talk about like social media, like the algorithms and things of that nature. But if if um you know, you're promoting a certain thing and, and you're putting it out there and people are, are looking for it. Hopefully that's the type of stuff that's going to help bring about that change, that's bringing about that light, that's bringing about that awakening, if you will, for people to kind of like, be able to say, okay, you know what? Yeah, there is something going on. Yeah, I can't be a, a, a part of bringing about something new. How can I do that? Okay, what can I do? You know, what can I take in more so that I'm not necessarily watching you know what I'm saying, day-to-day news or what's going on, uh, you know, whatever the mainstream um, you know, uh, news sources are that individuals watch. Um, that, to me, is how I feel like, you know, that that new change, that new thought, that new foster of, um, of, of movement will, will happen because, yeah, looking to get it from, you know, um, the main sources, I don't think that's going to really work all the way because, again, like, it, it's, it, it, this is... It's not necessarily co-aligned with how things have been going. You know what I'm saying? You're trying to like disrupt. Yeah, I think you know? there's a shift. E. My point is this: like, okay, you know, mainstream media still has its role, right? They still have a lot of money back behind it, so they still can dictate some things and they can promote messages um, on a level that you know these grassroots options, like whether it's YouTube, other social media, can't do. So I'm saying it still has its place and it's, it's replaced. That's what I'm talking about. So until it's like actually replaced and it's fully like, okay, social media, YouTube and stuff like that, um, I, I think it still has its place in the world. And I think a black company that can rival like CNN or Fox, and that's just I about black people promoting, promoting our agenda would be in I our best interest. I think the issue is bigger than that. I, my, my opinion falls somewhere in between both of yours. Um, and that is, oh God, I hate when I get something in my eye. But um, it's more so like, yeah, there's definitely, you know, more grassroots, smaller media companies out there, people out there doing their thing. Um, um, people out there actually trying to push the Black agenda and the, po- the positive Black agenda um, out there in, in media and using that platform. But it is on a smaller scale. Even if you take somebody like Diddy, who has a much larger platform, um, and and he really is going hard with his revolt platform to try to make sure the black agenda is pushed. Um, I think that it, it it that's all good, and they should continue to do that. However, I think the issue really lies within the major companies, like you know, there's like three big ones. Right. And remember, like we were talking about Bill Cosby and the whole theory that he was getting ready to buy CBS, which is one of the big ones. Um, The next thing you know, all these sexual allegations came out. So, excuse me, to me, I think that once you're able to do something like that, get something, either make room for a fourth or do something about the three. But I think there's always room for more. It's just that people don't want to make room for more. I think that's more about finances than it is anything else and just, you know, money as opposed to just trying, uh, let me rephrase that. I think that's more about capitalism than racism. However, they use that capitalism to continue to perpetuate the issues of discrimination and racism. You know what I mean? And that's one of the reasons why Black folks are continually perpetuated in the light that they are. Um, like, uh, 
one thing that I, I wanted to say really quick before we transition, two things rather. Um, one thing that when Malik was talking, when he was talking about um, health care and, 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 and looting and things like that, it reminded me of when Ferguson was happening, when the people were out there rioting in Ferguson. I remember watching, I don't remember which, I don't even remember if I watched it on the news or if I saw it on social media, but there was some newscast where there was, you know, how the police were freaking shooting tear gas at people and there was all kind of crazy stuff going on. And remember, it was like a continual loop. So the Senate is showing all of this stuff going on in Ferguson. And then at that time, somebody in, an, uh, was it Afghanistan or Iran or Iraq? In one of those countries, they were getting ready to be beheaded. An American was, was getting ready to be beheaded. And um, I remember when the news reporter cut out of, she was in the middle of talking to somebody about, um, about what was going on overseas. And the producers, because some stuff started happening in Ferguson, immediately cut into her story with them and started showing stuff going on in Ferguson. And I remember she said something to the effect of, um, we're not going to talk about what's going on in Ferguson right now because we're talking about them trying to kill an American and I remember thinking to myself you're talking about some one American overseas who's getting ready to die from terror from a terror from a terrorist versus something that's happening right here at home where you have black people being terrorized it's a balancing act and what you're doing is you're saying one life is more important than all these other lives over here when you make a statement like that you know what I mean? And that's the mentality of a lot of people. They're looking at it like, all right, this is something that's happening over here. Black people is just acting like a bunch of apes and gorillas and tearing stuff up. But we have this distinguished American over here who's about to get his head chopped off for being in another country, right? And it's like, that, that's not how it works. One is not more important than the other. And that goes to that whole Black Lives Matter thing. Those Black lives don't matter any less than the guy overseas, right? Um, and so... One of the other things that you had said, Malik, when, was when you, you talk about how the media talks about why are Black people tearing up their own communities. First of all, half these Black people don't own their community. Let's just keep that funky, right? Lots of Black folks don't own their community. They rent. So um, there's that. And then on top of that, when you start talking about looting, remember Michael, I mean, uh, Martin Luther King said that looting is, you know, the language of the unheard. So if you continue to oppress people, eventually you get to a boiling point and stuff gets torn up. Because it's like, if I keep asking you to do something or if I keep talking to you and I'm being calm about it and you're not listening, eventually somebody's going to start yelling. And then you're going to look at like, oh my God, why are you all freaked out? It's like, no, not oh my God. This has been building. And I've been saying something for an extended period of time and you're not listening. Now I have to act the fool to get your attention. And now you're looking at me crazy when we could have just handled this like um, distinguished people without have somebody having to cut the fool in order to make things happen. Um, and when that happens, you know, it's victim blaming, right? And, you know, and I'm gonna segue us into this video that um, I was about to show, but um, pretty much a situation happened, right? I mean, you got, people are gonna have their own opinions about it, but I found it very interesting where you have a black man and a white man in a situation. And I'm not gonna sit here and talk about what happened because he's gonna get ready to play the thing. I want everybody to go ahead and take a look. It's that one, scroll up a little bit, E, because we're just looking at Angel's pictures from Instagram. Uh -huh, it's right there. So this took place in Tampa. Is it on mute? He directed a number of those slurs at the employee. Three days later, the elderly man has died. And Fox 13's Catherine Hawley is live in Tampa with more so, yeah, on the story. Like the Catherine. That we had Corey Pajols is in jail tonight, charged with Fox aggravated manslaughter. Tampa police say one punch caused that customer to fall and hit his head on the concrete floor, dying from his injuries just days later. 
Everything started last Tuesday around 1.30 p.m. in the drive-thru of this Dunkin' on South 50th Street. Tampa oh, police say crazy. a 77-year-old customer was upset over the lack of service he was receiving. The victim parks the car, goes inside, and has an argument with the employee. Well, at that time, there was a racial slur that was thrown out at the employee, and the employee told the victim to say it one more time. That employee was 27-year-old Corey Pajols. According to arrest paperwork, when the elderly man repeated the same racial slur, Pajols punched him once in the face. The suspect ended up punching the victim so hard that he fell back, hit his head on the ground. And so when we arrived, he was unconscious and bleeding from the head to where he had to be taken to the hospital. Court documents yeah. say the man was rushed to the intensive care unit at TGH. Being Yeah, so I mean, just a quick moment, like that was... That's tragic of a situation that had to like spur out that way, you know. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, no, like, just that's, I'll say what I'll say what I have to say. Great that. injuries. He never regained consciousness, passing away Friday. A doctor told officers the man had a skull fracture and brain contusions. This customer was a regular. He apparently came by that Dunkin' Donuts a lot. Pajols told investigators the elderly man was being extremely rude that day. Police writing in the report, at no time did the decedent place his hands on the defendant or attempt to strike the defendant. Pajols was initially charged with battery that was upgraded to aggravated manslaughter after the 77-year-old died. And Pajols is set to be in court for that new charge this Thursday. Kelly. All right, Catherine Hawley reporting for us tonight. Thank you, Catherine. It turned out to be a killer punch. A 27 year old. Yeah, boy yeah. Um, or took a swing at a 77. Yeah, you can exit out. Um, it's the same story twice in two different news outlets. But oh, one okay, of the things, okay. yeah, what I was going to say was that um, it's just interesting. Like, is it unfortunate that the guy died? Yes. But at the same time, like, people really got to think about this. Using racial, racial slurs is protected language, right? And what I mean by that, in the, in the eyes of the law, right, um, you can call somebody a racial slur and it not be an issue like it would be if you screamed fire in a crowded movie theater. Screaming fire in a crowded movie theater is, protect, is not protected speech. You could get in serious trouble for it, right? Um, it's not even considered a fighting word, right? In the eyes of the law. I would, but I would, I would, I would like a little pushback as well because in certain states, like you know, what I mean, different language that you may use, like, can be technically considered to be like, especially even when we look at the last law. What was it? The um, the anti-Asian law. Like, if you happen to use a slur in that context within doing something, like you know what I'm saying to an Asian person, it kind of right. <laughs> So elevated, I, right? I, I, do, I do agree that like it, it by right. itself is it, but I don't want anyone to get it misconstrued as to think right. that, you know that it wouldn't be a consequence okay. or it couldn't elevate situations if it was used. But please, continue. right? But the the problem is, especially when you're talking about in terms of using racial slurs like the N word and things like that. In a situation like that, you have a 77 year old man who grew up in it's Tampa, it's the South. So who, you know, was around with Jim Crow, felt like he could, it was okay for him to use that word, probably used it a thousand times before. Now, that next news clip that we cut off, one of the things that I, 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 real, I found out was, you know, that employee, that black kid, that black kid, he, he was a nice guy. He would have people help him out. Um, he was always at work. They were always having friendly conversations. The alleged victim in this case, he um, was a regular at that Dunkin' Donuts. So the gentleman that's given to, to, that's talking about it, he's also a regular, so he knew both of them. And he was like, oh, he must have been having a really bad day because that guy normally doesn't act like that, da 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 And it was just really an unfortunate series of events. I agree. But just because you're upset about whatever's wrong with your order doesn't give you the right to go into an establishment and start cutting a fool and start calling people outside their name. You know what I mean? That goes to the whole customer service thing that we've talked about before, but also too, 
It's very different, especially too, when you're in a, an environment, a hostile environment that we are living in today in this country with all the things going on, racially speaking, to go into an establishment and feel the need to call somebody you see every day, a black man that you see every day, a racial slur. I don't know if it doesn't say what the racial slur is. They could have called him an N. He could have called him a monkey. He could have called him a boy. Because what a lot of people don't know is calling a black man, a white man calling a black man boy is definitely racial because that's what slave owners and slave masters used to do to black men, just to continue to belittle them. Right. Um, and so it, it's just it's 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 definitely unfortunate. But if if you notice, right, in that situation. Yeah, it's not good that the white guy died, but he shouldn't have, he, sh he probably shouldn't have been in there, you know, in instigating that situation. No, he didn't put his hands on him, but people don't realize what, what racial slurs do to black people and how much restraint it takes for black people to not react whenever they're called racial slurs. You know, people just, they just don't get it. They don't understand. And yeah, there's a whole argument about people using it, black folks using, calling each other nigga or whatever. But at the end of the day, when you're using it in those types of contexts, you don't know what it does to a person's psyche. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's why we need those protections that we were talking about the other day. You know, with right. uh, how the Asian, and how uh, Everett just brought that up, the anti- hate bill for Asians, uh, we need something similar to protect us from these comments and these attacks fr from other ci individual citizens and even, you know, state sanctioned officers. Uh, we, we need protections. So like in case of these situations, you know, everybody will get the full context, context, not just like, oh, he was just called a name. So he just decided to punch this guy and kill him and then ends up making this guy seem like some makes it seem like the guy who punched monster. him punched a monster and created right. a negative image. Like, look at him, and then they'll find the craziest picture of him and mm -hmm. display that, not like him, like, maybe going to church or something or whatever, looking his best or his Sunday's best, as uh, people used to say. They'll find the craziest picture and try to dig up some stuff. Maybe he had a little probation he had to do. They'll find that picture. Maybe he, was, he took right. some candy probation or something they'll just dig up some stuff so, right three, uh, three examples of that trayvon martin um george floyd um and and oj even right when trayvon martin was going through trial and, and when not trayvon martin when, when george zimmerman was on trial for murdering um trayvon martin and they found out trayvon used to smoke a little weed and he was getting in a little bit of trouble he's a kid there's plenty of white kids that do the same thing. So you're trying that, to find that, me. that was a BS excuse, Sam. Now, because you have all these cannabis dispensaries, these businesses. But no, at the time, up. at the time, at the time, they're trying to make it seem like he and he was bad enough to deserve the treatment that he received. You see what I'm saying? They, they want to have an excuse to justify what they're doing to black people. So they create the exactly. image like marijuana is a bad drug. So this guy was smoking some marijuana. So of course he was bad. But now it exactly. turns to find out white people smoke marijuana just as much, if not more than black people. And mm -hmm. it, it's being legalized all over the place. It's not federally, mm -hmm. but these states need money. So they're legalizing it. And these businesses are rising all the way to the top. Canada legalized it. You know, other countries have as well. So it's like, you know, it's just been a con game. It's just an excuse right. to lock up black people to further the prison industrial complex, further right. private prisons. I know there's been bills against those to limit that stuff, but they still exist. They but, 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 hold, but hold on, let me finish this. Hold on, let me just finish these two things and I and I'll give it to you, E. Um, with 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 um George Floyd. They were trying to find these, they were looking for all these crazy looking pictures of him. But with OJ, the really important thing about OJ is regardless if you believed he did it or not when it came to um, the murder of his ex-wife and um, her man friend, um, they looked for a picture and they changed the lighting to make it darker so that he would look more menacing just so they could plaster it on all magazines just so he can look more like a monster. You see what I'm saying? And it's like, but if that's not what the picture looked like, why, why you gotta do that? 
You know what I mean? We're, people are people. Everybody's not a monster. There are there monsters out there, yes, but everybody's not a monster. And so just because you believe, and remember, there's also the presumption of innocence. So people really have to recognize the fact that they're out here doing this stuff to people. And, it, and it's not always how it's supposed to go. That's not always the truth. It's just what somebody believes and they put it out there, especially, and the saddest thing is black, black men partic in particular in those types of situations get the short end of the stick because they're the ones that are made out to look like the, 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 the biggest monsters. Go ahead, E. Yeah, um, but also what I was gonna say within the imaging thing without, with, within black people, it, even from the standpoint of like, one, can we take it on so many different levels? Like the standpoint of, again, um, a person who is a victim in a situation and such as, um, you know, the Trayvon situation, now, you know, and even George Floyd situation, um, now you go from a standpoint of, you know, and, and we talked about this on one of our other shows, please check that out, um, where we reference how they become the individuals who become on trial. Their, their lives are the individuals who we now look at and we have to question, okay, well, you know, what did they do? Who were they? This, that, and the third. And again, none of that matters. Like, regardless of the fact, you know what I'm saying? Short of, I honestly believe of, of a taking of a life, you know what I'm saying? Then, you know, um, and, and that does mean that it doesn't necessarily mean that, I don't necessarily know how I want to say it, that the taking of a life should be take, like, um, judged. That's the vibe. To judge someone on necessarily what they do. Like I'm not the end all be all, but a taking of a life is, is a very serious thing even though there's a lot of crimes that are done where there isn't a life that's lost, but still there are, you know, things that, that take place after the fact. So if someone loses their life, that's a, that's a victim at that point. You know what I'm saying? And so for you to now then, depending on, like I said, the context of the situations and things, but um, a person that loses their life in a situation such as Trayvon's case, we should say, um, and then for you to then go back to looking at them and to questioning, you know, and guys, Sam just told us that she had to get something for our charger real fast. So that's why we had this little blanking. But for, for then, for there to be things in which um, they're, they're now being questioned as to, well, did they deserve to live? What type of person are they? That's the type of stuff that it makes me say like, you know, how are you gonna question, you know what I'm saying? Whether somebody's life should be alive and why are we looking at how a teenager was living their life versus how a grown man harassing a teenager is living their life because i can assure you mr um what zimmer george um what would not have been following another grown man like that you understand what i'm saying he ended up trying to probably because that's one thing about bullies as you'll know they like normally try to pick on people that they know they can get off with but like if it's somebody that you question or not like bullies are normally weak you know what i'm saying they don't they don't pick on people that they know they can get that real challenge they're not going around looking for you know what i'm saying the best of the best you feel me a lot of times they're just enforcing it on you know someone that they think they can get it off on as we've seen with the other um who was it the lieutenant who was who was trying to bully the young man that was living in his own neighborhood walking around in his own neighborhood and then we seen the people come out and start showing up every day to his house to see if he was going to push them out which he know all of those people that live in that neighborhood but still cameramen everybody all at that man's house because of the actions that he's taking and i think those are the type of things that we need to be able to see in society to let people know to wake up like think before you act stop trying to think just because what you saw on tv that that stuff gonna slide everywhere you at and that goes from that old man in tampa to that man that was uh like i said bullying that man that was walking into anybody else in today's society like you know you really need to question the actions that you're doing if you're doing something just on the strength of a person's skin color or how they are because you don't know that person you don't know what they're going through or, you know what i mean or who they are so if you don't know it's best that you either figure it out for yourself or go about your day because you know what i'm saying as we can see it can end a lot of different ways for a lot of different people so yeah. right and, and um i was just gonna go ahead and uh say that you know We've been focusing mostly on news media and, and, and stuff like that, but the stuff also happens with social media too. You know, so, social media is full of some of the biggest bullies as well, right? Um, if you look at um, the girl's name, I don't know how I forgot it that fast. 
um, the tennis player. Yeah, Naomi, no, Naomi Osaka, right? She decided to not participate. I believe it was like in the French Open or something. And yeah. she has since been getting raped through the coals as a result. Um, but she chose to do it for her own mental health. You got to take care of you first at the end of the day. So it's interesting because it's almost like they want to see the poor girl snap, right? And like he just said, like you never know what somebody else is going through. Because you remember, these people are human too, right? Excuse me, you never know what people are going through and things like that. And they, they like, if you look at even Serena, right? They give Serena a hard time about what she wears when there's white women that wear the same exact thing. The only difference is because she's thick. Right, I mean that's her body structure, right? Um, and uh, Pierce Morgan, that guy, um, he just doesn't know how to let go of anything, especially as it pertains to Meghan Markle. He needs to just let it go. My God. Um, so uh, I'm about to share my screen so I can show you all the um, the tweet that he put out there um about her um and here it is it says narcissistic naomi cynical exploitation of mental health to silence the media is right from the megan and harry playbook of wanting their press and cake i mean wanting the press and cake i'm sorry press cake and eating it um and then he goes on with more good god because she withdrew from the yeah to prioritize her mental health she withdrew from the u.s open i mean the french open and then, it, then she got fined, right? She got fined because she decided to take care of herself. And if that doesn't bother you, nothing will, because people should definitely be able to, to, to take care of themselves. You know what I'm saying? I think that it's absolutely disgusting that, you know, that, you know, she's, she's gone through that. Um, I believe there's a second article, but I'm gonna let you guys go ahead and, um, she's young. She's young. She might be like 18, yeah, she, she, something I don't necessarily know. Yeah, but she, she, she is young, but um, I was gonna say like this is very disheartening because like you know you see how the power, how much power the media has. They can find you. They can default you from tournaments if you don't talk to them. It's like man, sometimes people don't want all that pressure. They just want to play the game that they love, do what they do for their job. So I mean, I do feel sorry for. Her you know, sports athletes, but, you know, the the positive is is that with the media, it comes to money, right? You get the endorsement deals, you get the commercials, you get that, you get the followers, they help you get all that kind of stuff. But the bad news is, you know, you get all that pressure, you know, some people can't handle all that stuff. So I, I don't think you should find people if they don't want to talk to you, but I understand that you have to figure out a way for these players to talk to the media but I think they need to, if, if the players say, hey, I need to take a mental health break, you shouldn't find them. Like, if they have legitimate reasons why they're not trying to talk to you, you shouldn't have to pay some sort of fine because you're going through something. Or I, I, I was going to say, I would even go as far as saying, like, the way this should be able to be addressed is something as simple as, okay, if you if, if you're if you you're needing to take you know time we're gonna we're gonna allow certain things we understand that this this is a show everything has to go on this is part of the programming you know what I'm saying you put on your show yeah. afterwards and press goes to like this is part like the media has to write this up in newspapers da, 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 da. like this is part of the machine so we need you to do this all right understood this is part of you doing your job understood as well people need breaks understood people need time to take for themselves very much understood so we need to find a medium in which these two people can get everything accomplished so instead of it necessarily being hey she says you know what after the thing right now i don't feel like we able to speak to people whatever whatever the case may be it should be an obligation where maybe she says you know give me a a 24 hour or whatever the case may be and then they give you a little something i don't necessarily know or maybe she does it when she gets home and she opens up a zoom link and then she gets her interview later in the fact i 
I don't necessarily know, but there's a way in which you guys can probably both be able to work with it because maybe you tell her, hey, you know what? I understand, take some time for yourself, but we do need this to get done. And ideally, you can have within this time frame and that time frame. I get it. You can't always put people in a box depending on what the situation is. But I also think that there's a way in which this could be handled in a better situation because now it looks as though somebody saying, you know what, I need time for me. And now I got to tell you, I got to pay an extra cost for me just trying to get myself together to perform the way that I need to do on my job. And, you know, fortunately, unfortunately for her that she has it, but even fortunately, it's not something that's going to necessarily break her career. So, you know what I'm saying? I think maybe she might feel like, you know what, if that's the case, then fine. So be it. I'll pay that fine. I just wasn't going to go through with it. You know what I'm saying? At the time. And that that's that's tragic that you know what i mean you have to make those type of decisions when it comes to this something as simple as you getting yourself and your mindset where it needs to be so that you can be the best you and that's yeah. that's the number one thing because forget the game forget the show forget the press forget it all as long as you happy with your life like you know what that's that's it so forget the 15k forget you know what i'm saying all of that like that's the and I, and that's that's the most commendable thing. Like you know what I'm saying. We see yeah. a lot of people talking about, oh, you know, that I actually got fine. This is wrong. That's wrong. It is wrong. But more importantly, what's right about it is now someone can see somebody show. Listen, I don't care about the fine. I care about being able to say, you know what? When I need to do what I need to do for me, you know what I'm saying. And it's something to protect my man. So it's not nothing like I'm trying to be disrespectful or anything. I need to do something for me. Then. I'm going to prioritize that, even if it means, you know, uh, me having to, to take take some of this heat. But the other thing, too, is e, like the media in general is just really entitled. Right. They feel like you have to when you're a public figure, you have to share your life and everything with them. Right. Like, look at what happened with Princess Diana. She was going through her own mental stuff and they still chase her down to her death. Right. And now they're, they're bringing up. Um, Naomi and comparing her to Meghan Merkel because Meghan Merkel just got finished saying how her mental health was, you know, in jeopardy based on the media. So um, here's another uh, article where Donald K. Kip Kiorir, I don't know, know if I'm pronouncing his name right. I don't know who he is, um, but he's verified. You see, you got the blue check mark. Um, he had some tweets as well. And what he said was Meghan Merkel and Naomi Osaka are women of color, they're black women, let's just, they're biracial black women, let's just go ahead and call it what it is. Um, they're both women of color who are at the peak of human social strata and both have complained of depression wrought, um, wrought on by the media. Instead of embracing them, Britain allows race whistlers such, such as Pierce Morgan um, to poo poo their mental anguish and it has to stop. Shout out to him, you know, for standing up for black women. Then you have Dr. Coakley, whoever that is, says the U.S. Open refusing to address Naomi's, uh, Naomi Osaka's mental health concerns feels eerily similar to the royal family <laughs> refusing to address Meghan Markle's mental concerns. It's almost as if Black girls' mental health doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to say something to that before I move on. Black girls' mental health doesn't matter. I would say Black people's mental health doesn't matter to much of society and the health of Black women doesn't matter to to most because black women have to fight an extra fight anytime they go get any type of health care. You know, um, we've touched on this before as, as it relates to um, black women in the medical system. And so it's definitely something that, you know, needs to be addressed on a bigger scale, especially when you're talking about protecting black folks. Um, then this person, their name is a TV fan, a fanatic. She says it really hurts to see the media and others always questioning women of color like Meghan Markle and Naomi Osaka when they talk about their mental health. Like, why just us? It's a good question. And then this person says, between Meghan Markle and Naomi Osaka, Black women are villainized for talking about and prioritizing their own mental health. The Miss Genoir is disgusting when, uh, I don't even know if I said that right, um, is disgusting when Black women are in pain. No one cares until it's too late. My goodness, how many are there of these? Yeah, I think we got I'm going to just do this last one and then we'll end it. Uh, think of how the media treats women who speak about their mental health from Naomi Osaka to Meghan Markle. 
from Princess Diana to Amy Winehouse, from reality TV stars to royalty. Women, the women change, the will to humiliate doesn't. Um, it is deeply rotten, outdated, and needing to change. And I agree with that statement. Um, I absolutely agree with it. And people like Pierce Morgan, he needs to, I don't know what his problem is. He might need to go seek somebody, <laughs> to be completely honest, to be that stuck on one person that you barely had one date with is obsessive. Um, and he really needs help. Um, but with that being said, um, I, I just think it's, it is really sad um, that, that when, when Black folks, especially Black women, try to speak up for themselves and say, this is what I need, they get ridiculed as opposed to assistance. You know what I'm saying? Um, you guys, what do you guys have to say about that or what do you think? Um, well, I think uh, Black people, not just Black women, but Black people in general, their mental health isn't uh, focused on enough. Um, but in this particular cases uh, with uh, Meghan Markle and Naomi Osaka, I think, you know, what Piers Morgan is doing is, is disgusting and that, you know, you know, the, in Meghan Markle's case, you know, the royal family of uh, Great Britain, UK, um, they have a history of this racist acts. I mean, I know they try to downplay it, but I mean, it's starting to come out to light of their racism. We already know, I mean, UK, Great Britain, they have a history of, uh, you know, colonizing con other countries and doing all kinds of racist stuff continue to this day. Um, and now in you know, Osaka, yeah, there's there's plenty of racism that's in the undertones of everything. Um, so I think that's that. But I think as a solution to this mental health stuff, I think, you know, that's where Black media comes into play to help focus on that for Black people because you can't really expect, you know, other groups' medias to focus like, oh, yeah, they're going to really promote in the best interest of Black people because we have a history of it showing that, you know, these white media outlets, they're gonna do what's in the best interest of them and who funds their pockets, which are these big old companies and other uh, hedge funds and all this other stuff that want things to go their way. So they're not, and they're, and things going their way doesn't, doesn't include the best interest of black people. And I think people need to realize that, like these big news outlets and media companies are against you as a group. Not just you as an individual, not just you as a gender, but they're against Black people as a group specifically, and they've demonstrated that time and time again. Um, so uh, that's mainly my thoughts, and I think the solution to that problem, just to wrap it up for me on the issue, is you know we need our own media. Keep you know the, the little grassroots people keep doing what you're doing. You know if you got podcasts, if you got a YouTube channel, whatever, do what you need to do. We, we, we need more money to be injected in mainstream media like cable, those other news medias to compete. Um, we need more focus and more money to compete on a national and global level. So I think we need a demand for that, demand our legislators to do something about that. And I think that's the best what we can do right now. That's my thoughts. Um, Margo, uh, I definitely agree with some of your sentiments that you just um stated, um, certainly think that uh, what we have going on currently with everybody um, doing what exactly like you said, you know, podcasts, you know, vlogs, you know, all of those things, um, posts, Instagram, using social media to kind of use their platform to spread their message. Um, uh, and if it's a positive message or something that's, you know, something that the universe needs, then I'm, I'm, I'm happy for it. Um, and I think that that's the way, because uh, fortunately, like I said, you know, we are, um, although things aren't always great, but they are progressive in a sense that um, we've had progressive technology, I should say, because <laughs> um, I don't want to make it confused as to think that even, even though there are certain strides that we have made as a community, they're not enough for me to even state that it's, it's, it's been progressive, because as a whole, there haven't been. So, um, and I'm not the type of individual to think that just because one person has it, that that means that the group all has access to it. And that's not how it works, you know what I mean? Um, 
don't care how much one individual assumes if the whole is still down then you know what i'm saying that individual does not represent the the state of all individuals that um that look like them so a seat at the table type of mindset isn't, isn't isn't cutting it for me i think you know we we need to see people from in all communities doing well we need to see people within all communities be able to feel like they don't like you said earlier people root because they feel like they haven't been heard they ask they ask they ask and then they take you know there shouldn't be a reason for people to have to take in the richest country of the world you know what i'm saying or excuse me um one of the richest countries in the world um and so i feel as though you know, we need to continue to spread the word, continue to spread knowledge, continue to ask people to, you know, look up and, and, and know their situation in society, know where they stand financially, know where um, we're trying to get it to, um, be selective in which how they're moving in the thing in the people in which they're dating and, and, and procreating with, um, so that we can, you know, continue to build stronger communities and things of that nature. Um, but all in all, I definitely want to say it too, and also being more mindful of how we are being portrayed in the media. So if you have a ability to affect the imagery that you portray, then you know be mindful of that because we also know that that's the same type of imagery that one day may be trying to get used against you if God forbid anything ever comes up. So, um, and also let's control our media by being able to prevail ourselves but through our own medias as well and shout out to revolt um shout out to like you said the other channel with uh Byron Allen. he's another person that's in media that owns their own stuff and shout out to other content creators who are controlling um the narratives that they're putting out there and salute to them um yeah for my, my closing thought like we didn't get too heavily into social media and the um, aspects of that and how the images, just generally speaking, without getting too specific, I mean, short, the images make people want to change their lives and make people feel like they're behind in the world. They make women feel like their body needs to be perfect. And they just create this image that life is this perfect, great play, great thing. And it is great. It's a blessing, but it's not perfect. There's no such thing as perfect. And um, and it's important to just really recognize that when you're looking at the images of people in social media, um, everybody has problems, right? Nobody's life is perfect. There's a lot of good things going on. That's one of the downsides to social media. But one of the good things is that it gives people a voice. It's just like the news, right? When we're talking about news media, it, it gives people information, lets people know some of the things that are going on in the world, but it's not always accurate. And social media, one of the benefits to it kind of helps people to fill in the gaps. Um, although some of that's abused and they put a lot of conspiracy theories out there and fake information, um, it still can help put a lot of things out there. And I found um, this quote by somebody named Roxanne Gay, and it says, social media is something of a double-edged sword. At, at its best, social media offers unprecedented opportunities for marginalized people to speak and bring much needed attention to the issues that they face. At its worst, social media also offers everyone an unprecedented opportunity to share in collective outrage without reflection. And I think that that's really important because although it may give voice to the voiceless, it also empowers hatred um and so i think that we just have to be careful you know we just have to be very careful in the information that we put into our brains and just really make sure we're understanding what it is we're listening to what it is we're watching and and making sure we're double checking for accuracy because you know again as we've stated throughout this whole entire podcast today um especially when you're talking about the community, not everybody's there to uplift us. And so we just have to be mindful of that and just continue to think positive thoughts, be there for one another and try to be as kind as we can for, to each other and support one another because you know, we're not gonna get there by ourselves. We're only gonna get there if we're unified. Um, so with that being said, um, as far as media is concerned, also, I do think that we need to just expand, continue to expand, flood the market, you know, make it so that these three major companies can't continue to capitalize off of media to try to 
keep us included, um, whether it be a seat at the table or we have our own table. Either one is fine with me. We just got to do something different because this ain't it. And it's it's making us hate ourselves to an extent. And it's giving people a false image of who we are in other places, even in our in our motherland. You know, there are people that look at Black people like we're a bunch of violent people and we just jump around and do crime while we look at them like they're a bunch of people that just live in villages no. kill lions when in actuality that ain't it yes are there people that live in villages yes just like here there are people that are violent but there's also it's very industrialized over there in um, pretty much every country in africa just like there's a whole lot of black people out here in america that are, ain't violent and that aren't out here committing crimes and doing all other foolish foolish stuff that they try to perpetuate in the media just so they could keep us divided. So with that being said, guys, um, that was my final thought. Um, we thank you all for joining us today and st sticking with us. Uh, we did go a little over time, but I think it was worth it. Um, I'm one of your co-hosts again, Samantha Adams. Make sure you follow us on Counterpoise Podcast, um, on Instagram, Facebook, and on YouTube. This video will be uploaded today onto um, our YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and watch it, share it, like it, um, subscribe to our channel, tell a friend to tell a friend, do whatever you got to do on all of our social media platforms. If you want to follow me by, um, specifically on Facebook, my name is Samantha Adams hyphen ESQ. And on Instagram, it's Samantha Renee 77 underscore ESQ. Guys. Um, I'll go um, this is Everett Stevenson. Um, um that's my name. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my Instagram, that guy 2104. Um, you can catch me out on that. Um also again follow the page, Counterpoise Podcast on IG as well. We also go live every Wednesday with just a you know topic that we like to discuss, whatever's going on in the world, something random we may you know, throw a little games or two in there. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Might even do a little lolly next week. You never know. <laughs> but uh, check in with us on Wednesday nights around 8, 8, 8 o'clock. Um, and also catch us on Facebook as well, Connor Poise Podcast. Thank you guys for the love and support. Oh, yeah, guys. Y'all can follow me at Malik M. Foster on all social media platforms. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Uh, you can follow us all at uh, Counterpoise Podcast. That's our Instagram and Facebook and our YouTube. So just check us out, support us, and we're out of here. Hey. Wait,